It's good work. Now I need you to show up at the campaign office. <laughs> it's good work. Building community. It wasn't just Puerto Ricans that were offended that day. It was humanity and anyone of decent character. Building community. A fight for the future. And that strength cannot be taken from us. Campaign office. <laughs> Why did Harris lose the election? What went wrong with the Harris campaign? Unintentionally, this speech, which is meant to be uplifting and powerful, but ends up being anything but, sheds light on the linguistic mistakes Harris makes, not to mention her deceptive rhetorical tactics. In this video, I'll take a closer look at these mistakes and tactics to see what we can learn from them. Welcome or welcome back to the channel. Hang on, because things are about to get cringeworthy. Time to get the empowering journey started. What we did in 107 days was unprecedented. Think about the coalition that we built, and we were so intentional about that. Of course they were. The coalition was part of their groupthink-based rhetoric, getting people to see themselves, speak, and believe as members of a group first and foremost, not as individuals. Harris makes it sound like a calculating tactic, which it is. You would hear me talk about it all the time. Being a daughter of parents who are active in the civil rights movement, I know and believe that the best movements that are about progress in our country mean that it's leaders that you, that we, are dedicated to the coalition. So, the best kind of movement is one where people are dedicated to the coalition. What's next? That the sky is blue. Movement and coalition are synonyms, are near synonyms. So Harris's claim is an exercise in circularity while trying to sound profound. Also, you don't have to have parents who've been active in the civil rights movement to know how a movement works. So mentioning this is thinly veiled self-branding. Progress is a so-called floating signifier. Floating signifiers don't have fixed definitions. Speakers use them to give the impression that complex and ambiguous issues are simple and easy to define, as if progress and freedom belong to their side. Subjectivity masked as objective truth. Because in reality, many people would call Harris's definition of progress, which he doesn't even give here, regression to bringing people together that seemingly have nothing in common, but have everything in common. A coalition where we bring people together based on a deep love of our country and our understanding that the strength of our country will be a function of our willingness to put in the work and that we will do that work with a sense of joy, yes, with a sense of work ethic and understanding it's going to be hard, but it's good work. It's good work to be engaged in a collective fight for America's future. If you think that Harris saying a lot without actually saying anything, welcome to the club. Movement. Coalition. I mean, coalition. Love she doesn't talk about country. which love of our country and why her supposed movement has the right to monopolize this phrase. Because this is so unspecific, plenty of other movements would be able to do that too. If Harris presumably speaks for all Americans, what about the Americans who don't want to be part of her movement? A question like this exposes that this is purely a rhetorical tactic. It isn't real. The There's no causal relation country. between putting in work and the phrase, the strength of our country. Because what matters is what kind of work you put in. What your specific policies, goals and ideals are. Thus, what Harris calls strength, many people would call weakness or immoral. Which exposes the subjective surface level language for what it is. Empty platitudes that anyone, irrespective of political stance, could use as well. Thus, when Harris says we, together. our, and bringing people together in order to brand herself as inclusive, she refers to people who already agree with her. The generic and misleading platitude, love of our country, is designed to distract from her specific policies. Groups are easier to upset and control than individuals. Politicians bank on that. That's why they speak in terms of we and our, and they use intentionally vague and ambiguous language to appeal to as many voters as possible. But it's good work. It's good work. Only if you agree with the specific policies, 
Otherwise, it's bad work. A collective Being fight. engaged in a collective fight, more groupthink-based rhetoric to persuade the masses, isn't good in itself. It all depends on what you're fighting for, specifically. Historically, there have been many collective fights and movements that have done terrible things. So Harris isn't making actual arguments here. And it means so much to me and to Governor Walls that you knocked on doors, you called friends, you, 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 you called in favors. You said, hey, you know, I showed up at your, your softball game, now I need you to show up at the campaign office. <laughs> Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Just because you can do a speech doesn't mean that you should, let alone upload it for everyone to see. I'm glad the Harris campaign did it, though. Because of your efforts? Get this. We raised an historic $1.4 billion, almost $1.5 billion, from grassroots supporters alone. The most in presidential campaign history. What was the campaign about? setting new records and spending. Get What's this. more important to get is that this isn't something Harris should be presenting as a milestone, especially considering how the election turned out. Harris continues to display a striking lack of self-awareness. Running for office and losing shouldn't be about setting records and spending, especially not when you use that money for rallies where self-proclaimed celebrities can't speak without a prompter, a smartphone, and don't have much meaningful to say. But this is the most important stage I've ever been on. And let me tell you, it has never felt <laughs> the way it does tonight. It has nothing to do with me and everything to do with you. A choice between divided and united. <laughs> ladies, where are my ladies at? Where are my Latinos at? I believe in the power of our community. One second, guys, one second. Thank you. All right. And I believe her when she says she will provide a tax cut to a hundred million middle class Americans. That's a lot of Americans. Understand that the work that we did That's a lot included of the work that so many of you here did, which is to talk to first time voters. Many of you are first time voters. Yes, and that tactic is easy to see through. First-time voters have limited experience with the world, with politics, with life in general. So appealing to them via platitudes and slogans is hardly something to be proud of. In the following, notice how the first-time voters that Oprah of all people introduces don't make actual arguments. Their opinions are as surface level as the platitudes they were persuaded by. And Oprah thinks everything's fantastic. So Phoenix, I hear you did research before voting. I did. Um, it was really important to me that like the policies that Kamala Harris has proposed for women's reproductive rights and education equality are what led me to cast my ballot for her. Fantastic. So voting this election just means so much to me and I plan to become a future OBGYN and I'm so excited to vote for Kamala Harris to ensure my future patient's freedom. That's fantastic. And that's one of the pieces that I just want us to please take away. That our fight for freedom and for opportunity and for the promise of America, it included, for example, nearly almost 4 million first-time contributors to our campaign. Really, that's the promise of America, that people contribute to your campaign. The syntactic focus in Harris's utterances is the money she got from first-time contributors. Not the floating signifiers, freedom, opportunity, and the promise of America that she keeps mentioning without detailing and proving what they mean. This shows an important principle in politics and advertising in general. Money is what it's about. Money is the intention. The empty platitudes from freedom to inclusive to empowerment are part of the sales pitch, disguising the intention. In my opinion, it's strange that Harris keeps hammering this point, as if it's something to be proud of. Or do people like to be reminded of the money they spent when their candidate lost? Because of the work you did of helping people 
know that they can be engaged and that they're not outside, that they're inside, that we're all in this together. Sounds nice and cozy, right? In politics, there's no such thing. When people are inside, as in inside the group, it becomes increasingly difficult for them to disagree with the other members of the group. And you wouldn't want to be an outsider, right? Everything is loving, inclusive and tolerant, as long as you believe the same as everybody else in the group. Groupthink-based rhetoric exists to remind people of that without reminding them directly, because when you're inside, there's always a chance that you could end up outside, in case you don't agree. Outside, inside. And that work continues. The work must continue. Yes, the work must continue. I applaud that. In the following, notice the telling micro-pauses, showing that even Harris isn't convinced by what she's regurgitating. The work must continue of, of reminding ourselves that we have an ability to stay engaged in a way that will make a difference. The work that you all did, it's going to have lasting effect. Unintentionally, by speeding up her speech pace, she lets the audience know that what she's saying and has a hard time completing doesn't make much or any sense. An ability to stay engaged in a way that will make a difference. The work that you all did, in a way that will make a difference. The work that you all did. Reminding themselves of an ability to stay engaged in a way that will make a difference. An utterance can't get much more indirect and disingenuous than that. So what is the way to make a difference? Will we ever know? But understand that the work we put into it was about empowering people. That's the spirit with the work we did. Yes, such an important thing to understand. I mean, it's not like everyone could say the same. And no, people, including Harris, put in the work to win the election. What Harris says here is a convenient, self-serving reinterpretation of the spirit of the work. Harris doesn't only seem incapable of speaking without buzzwords, but also campaign slogans. The next excerpt is unintentionally revealing in that regard. Our spirit and our work was about saying that it is a strength that we each have to lift people up as opposed to beating people down. It is a strength we have that has lasting effect. So all that work that you did that was about engaging with other people, engaging with perfect strangers and in their face seeing a neighbor, that has lasting effect. It reminds people that there are leaders like you who care and will bring us together to lift people up as opposed to beating people down. Some would suggest that my opponent and, and suggests, which is that the measure of the strength of a leader based on who you beat down. Come on. The real measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you lift up. In their face, seeing a neighbor. And this movement that we're in about, as I like to say, seeing in the face of a stranger a neighbor. Yes, 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 right? yes, yes. An extension of love thy neighbor, that you literally in the face of a stranger see a neighbor. Yes. And will bring us together. Yes, because Harris and like-minded people have always been about bringing people together. They wouldn't dream of saying anything divisive. Homophobia and transphobia are real in this country. LGBT rights are under attack. You guys know that about me. I'm a lover. I am not a fighter. I am not here to trash anyone or bring them down. I know what that can feel like, and I wouldn't do it to my worst enemy. He has consistently worked to divide us. At Madison Square Garden, he reminded us who he really is and how he really feels. It wasn't just Puerto Ricans that were offended that day, okay? It was every Latino in this country. It was humanity and anyone of decent character. I am not here to trash anyone or bring them down. Bring us together is a commonly used slogan used to make what's essentially calculating self-serving groupthink-based rhetoric sound appealing. You literally in the face of a stranger see a neighbor. Yes. This is emotional persuasion, the speaker tapping into and monopolizing certain values that she knows are popular and safe. This serves two functions, to imply that her opponents stand for the opposite and to virtue signal. Every pathos appeal in political rhetoric is used for self-aggrandizement.
and Harris uses effective prosody to make a point. I see a neighbor. I see a neighbor. Effective prosody is when speakers manipulate their voice somehow to convey emotion. As I like to say, seeing in the face of a stranger a neighbor. This kind of neighbor discourse comes from the New Testament, so this is hardly something Harris likes to say. And approach each other with that level of dignity and grace and and kindness. Dignity, grace, kindness. All platitudes that have whatever meaning the speaker attributes to them, which actually means that they don't have any meaning objectively. And people who disagree with Harris's opportunistic interpretation of these terms, what level of dignity, grace, and kindness will they be met with? Exactly, political rhetoric is about monopolizing nice-sounding terms before these terms can be used against the politicians using them. Seeing in the face of a stranger a neighbor, the real measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you lift up. Yes, because as we all know, Harris is all about lifting people up and seeing neighbors, even in her opponent's faces. With someone who professes to be a leader who spends full time demeaning and, and, and engaging in personal grievances, he's the one who tends to demean. He has the intelligence, the commitment, and the judgment. By contrast, the former president has none of that. Do you think Donald Trump is a fascist? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. It's based on who you lift up. That has lasting effect. That has lasting effect. It's always totally credible when you have to remind people of a point that should be obvious, in case it was obvious. It doesn't sound like damage control at all. To lift people up and in their face seeing a neighbor and will bring us together. And that strength cannot be taken from us. That is our strength. It cannot be taken from us. Yes, because Harris and like-minded people are the only ones who have the strength to know how to be good neighbors, lift people up and bring us together. Self-aggrandizing and conceited rhetoric disguised as a touching and powerful moment in the speech. A little too late for touching and powerful moments, by the way. And I need you to show up at the campaign office. <laughs> office. <laughs> so, listen, as I said the day after the election, I still strongly believe the light of America's promise will burn bright as long as we never give up and we keep fighting. And the fight that fueled our campaign, a fight for freedom and opportunity, that did not end on November 5th. A fight for the dignity of all people, that did not end on November 5th. A fight for the future, a future in which all people receive the promise of America? No. A fight that is about a fight for the ideals of our nation, the ideals that reflect the promise of America, that fight's not over. Is this an attempt at a speech, an attempt at setting a new record and saying the promise of America? The light of America's promise. The promise of America? The promise of America. The light of America's promise means whatever the speaker presupposes it means. So this pretentious phrase is as vague as the floating signifiers, freedom, opportunity, and dignity. Floating signifiers are empty because of their boomerang effect. What Harris and like-minded people call freedom, others call control. What Harris and like-minded people call dignity, others call immoral, etc. Thus, people can receive, receive the promise the of America, promise of a America? strange formulation, by the way, because the promise of America, to use Harris's terminology, means whatever politicians want it to mean, depending on the laws and policies they want to implement. For the ideals Same as the word ideals, which Harris simply presupposes, as if everybody knows which ideals and shares the same ideals, which they don't. Harris's rhetoric seeks to monopolize what the Founding Fathers themselves wanted for America, which is problematic when your allies have this to say. A 13-year-old transgender child wrote to me. I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable with that language of, like, g getting to the truth. Because that, it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and the if truth? You, and, and if you keep probing, we're going to stop the interview. I, if I probe about what the truth is? You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. A 13-year-old transgender 
child wrote to me. So look, we still have a lot to fight for, okay? Okay. Thank you for the reminder, which doesn't sound desperate. Okay, okay. A future where every American can pursue their dreams, ambitions, and aspirations. The ambition, the aspirations, the dreams of the American people. The aspirations, the goals, the ambitions of the American people. Our fight for the rule of law, for freedom for all, for equal justice. With freedom for all and equal justice, the speech just keeps getting more and more specific. Deceptive terms like these are designed to distract from what they entail. Kamala Harris believes in equal justice under law. And that means, not very complicated, equal justice under law. It is not to be debated. Equal justice under law, it's not a high bar. It's not a high bar. We protected transgender community and we banned banning books, especially banning LGBTQ books for themes in that. We must lead. We must be the country that leads on it. And I know this is an uncertain time. I'm clear-eyed about that. I know you're clear-eyed about it. And it feels heavy. The irony of using the word clear-eyed when this speech has shown a complete absence of introspection as to why they lost, a lack of understanding that it's the very platitudes and surface-level argumentation Harris keeps using that people are tired of. Maybe that's why she says clear-eyed about that, because deep down she knows she isn't clear-eyed about things that are actually important. By the way, I like how she nods her head after she's made a point, which isn't a point at all, as a way of affirming herself and guiding viewers to think that she's speaking the truth. It looks entirely authentic and organic. And it feels heavy. And I just have to remind you, don't you ever let anybody take your power from you. You have the same power that you did before November 5th. I take it this is the touching outro. It's working. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get emotional here. Talking about the power would only have had an effect if Harris had actually said something substantial and had shown ability to prove why this power is different from the power that her opponents have. This is the cost of being unspecific and intentionally vague. You have the same power. And you just stepped into your power? But as you've heard me say many times, we like hard work. Hard work is good work. Hard work can be joyful work. And in doing our work, we will remain committed and intentional about building community, building coalitions, reminding people that we all have so much more in common than what separates us. What better way to conclude this empowering speech than regurgitating a cliché from the script. Americans have so much more in common than what separates us. Or that we have so much more in common than what separates us. And we have so much more in common than what separates us. That's it. People have to spend their money on future campaigns to remind people that they have so much more in common than what separates them. Something which Harris has already repeated at nauseam, and which doesn't take away from the fact that there are policies that separate people. Harris herself doesn't exactly shy away from mentioning separating policies. I was there campaigning against a ballot measure that would have required young women to notify their parents before getting an abortion. Unintentionally, this is a shining example of how political slogans and platitudes are merely the sales pitch. Money is what it's about money for a new campaign using the same slogans and platitudes. And on and on it goes, it never changes. Next, more pretend community building in order to make money. We will be armed with the faith and the fuel that tells us what is possible and then drives us to achieve it. How can faith and fuel tell us anything about what's possible and what is possible? The speech is just so deep. We are all in this together, all right? We are all in this together. 
So she says while shaking her head no. The speech ends as it began, with the same deceptive groupthink based rhetoric that's really aimed at people's resources, money and time. I'm glad this speech, or whatever one feels like calling it, is made public, because it's a fitting end to a disastrous political campaign. However, there's a lot to learn from the many mistakes and deception of the Harris campaign. So to use Harris's words, what we've seen and heard cannot be taken from us. That is our strength. It cannot be taken from us. Until next time.